Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast, hosted by Bruce Hutchin and episode number 151. <laughs> Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast, where it is all about whitetail deer hunting tips, techniques, and the stories so you can become a more successful whitetail deer hunter. And now your host, Bruce Hutchin. We're heading down in Louisiana and Mississippi today to join up with Paul Raleigh, pro staff of Country Camel Outdoors. He's been hunting for almost 20 years. He hunts mostly whitetails and turkeys. Growing up, I didn't have anyone to teach me about hunting, so I started reading bow hunting magazines and other hunting magazines. The obsession to hunting grew, and I never looked back. I absolutely love everything about hunting, watching a buck grow all summer, making food plots or building food plots, trying to pattern deer. It's an obsession. I'm really into trail cam pictures i last year i have over a thousand trail cam pictures my hunting buddies call me crazy because of how much i look over the folders last couple of seasons i've gotten to take my nephew in the stand with me and he's loving it i enjoy teaching someone about hunting and the things i've learned over the years welcome to another episode of whitetail rendezvous this is your host bruce hutchin and we're heading south folks we're going to south louisiana to Paul Raleigh, and he's pro staff with Country Camel Outdoors. Paul, welcome to the show. Good afternoon, Bruce. How how you feeling? I'm feeling pretty darn good, and uh, I'm a lucky man because I got a I got a new hip, and I'm going to be ready for hunting season come come the fall. But hey, start right off. How would people get in touch with Country Camel Outdoors? How would they get in touch with you or the website? We have a, a website. It's countrycamooutdoors.com. Uh, I'm pro staff with them. Um, my link is on there. My bio is on there, um, along with all our other pro staff and field staff members. Now, you're also on Country Camel Outdoors on Facebook. Is that correct? Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Camel Photo. <laughs> All right, so folks, um, at, at any time that you want to check and, and reach out to Paul, he's graciously said that, hey, just reach out to him on those uh, social media platforms, and he'd be sure glad to get back to you. So, Paul, let's let's talk about hunting in South Louisiana. I've never hunted down there, and I understand you hunt in Louisiana and Mississippi. So talk to us about the terrain and um, just what kind of setups you have down there. Well, Louisiana have a small tract of family land, uh, 40 acres. It's more just a strip of land that we hunt. So deer don't tend to, to stay on our land. They just pass through. Um, and it's, it's a little swampy. It stays a little wet. We have some high ground here and there. Um, it, the deer are far. I say we don't see many deer. But when we do see them, you know, we're pretty, pretty happy about seeing them. Um, now, now, you talked about hard ground. Is that like ridges or explain it's not the hard ridges. ground? It's not so much ridges in the area I hunt. Uh, there's like little holes that, that hold water. And there's some spots that stay dry. And uh, mostly where I hunt is where the dry spots are. So, are you surrounded by you know bayous or creeks or you I, know? I have a, I have a bayou on the backside that the deer tend to follow. Um, matter of fact, my I killed a really nice eight point this year, walking along that bayou, just minding his own business, and I happened to be in the right spot at the right time. So when you think about um, hunting, you're a 365 day a year hunter, aren't you? That's correct. Now let's talk about preparation for hunting. And in the warm up, we we touched upon that. And I'd like you to expand that for our, our listeners and and tell them what that means to you and how that helps you uh, be a better hunter. Well, a few years back, I, I purchased a, a boss buck feeder. And I started feeding premium milk deer child. And where I hunt in Mississippi, 
<laughs> it's not a really known area for really nice bucks. Well, that year, we had quite a few really nice bucks stay in our area and main, you know, come into that feeder time and time and time and time. And we was able to pattern that deer. And a friend of mine was ended up harvesting us, har- harvest the deer. Beautiful, you know, 10 point buck. You know, by far the biggest deer that's ever been killed in our place. And we also plant soybeans to help bring our deer into our lease and hold them there. So what do you do during the year? You said you had a feeder. Now, mm-hmm. do you have food plots, micro plots? Tell us about, you know, your year round um, process. We, we have food plots. Um, during the summer, we'll plant soybeans. Um, there's another product I found called Mean Bean by Vault Harvest. And it has done absolute, absolute great job of, of pulling bucks in and holding them in our spot. Um, during the, the fall, I'll plant some other stuff that's worked really well as well. And so how do, how do you take care of that uh, land? Are you just like a farmer or do you visit it once a week? Uh, I'm- by a farmer, a farmer works at you know every single day or every single week. So tell us how you develop those food plots so they they produce good forage for the bucks. Uh, uh, I usually visit once a month, once every month and a half. I'll I'll make my drive up to Mississippi. Um, we have a tractor. We prepare the dirt. I I chop it multiple times to get you know a good good seed bed, um, fertilizing lime, and it's done very, very well for us to to hold deer on our place. Um, for a long time, we couldn't get deer to just stay on our place that we hunt. So when we started doing this, you know, maintaining good food plots, good high-protein food plots, and putting up them feeders with the high-protein feed, it's really helped us tremendously in holding deer in our area we hunt. Now, how big of uh, acreage do you have up there in Mississippi? We have a thousand acres. That's quite a bit of land. Now, is that pine or is that uh, hardwoods or it, what kind of it, land is it? It's pine and hardwood mix. And it's, it's difficult where we hunt. A lot of locals are there. They don't. They don't hunt for bucks per se. The big bucks. They almost shoot anything. You know, for us, it's hard to try to get a big mature deer to stay on our place. So that's when we started. You know, putting good feed, putting good good food plots, and it's really helped us. You know, the last few years. So by having the food there, um, you got to have some water there. You got to have cover there. So if you have those three things, what you're saying is that you're holding deer year round. Correct. We have a we have a creek that runs through the property. Um, we have good good thickets put in the hide in. It was just the, the the lack of good nutritious food is what we were missing. And then since we started doing that, we've we've had very good success. Now, in the warm up and in your bio, it says that you have thousands of trail camera pictures, and your honey buddies love it. They love, they laugh at you because of how much time you take looking at the pictures. Let's talk about that for a little bit and the importance of uh, of your trail cams. Well, uh, I like looking at my, you know, viewing my my pictures and getting to know my deer. You know, getting to know. Almost in everything about them. If there's a little nick in the ear, you know, when I see this deer, I know what deer it is. And I can, you know, age it, you know, kind of determine on the size of it and whatnot. And my buddies, they, they're they not as serious as I am about it. So they do kind of make jokes about it. But whenever it comes down to it, they know they can come to me, hey, you seen this deer before? Yeah, I've seen that deer. 
you know. So what's a what's a buck have to be to make it to your hit list for any you know particular year? Uh, so like I said, where I hunt, it's a thousand acres. The locals around us, they they not worried about size of deer. Um, I'm always looking for a, a nice buck, but if it's coming down to the wire and I haven't really killed anything, you know, I'll, I'll take a, a younger deer, you know, so I could have meat and provide for my family. Now, do you have a doe only season or how do you, how do you keep the whole, uh, your herd balanced? In, in Mississippi where I hunt, you can shoot those the whole season. Um, I, I personally don't like shooting those out there. I, I'd rather shoot a buck. Um, we trail cam picture wise, we have way more bucks than those. So when we look at that, we, we, I don't like shooting a dope personally, at least in, in my place in Mississippi. <laughs> So it sounds like, just from what you just said, you get a lot of bucks. So competition during the rut's going to be fierce. Correct. So do they come in pretty good to rattling? We haven't had much success with rattling, but we've had had them grunting at us. We've had pretty good success with grunting, but the rattling hasn't been as successful. I guess maybe it's because... We don't have as mature of deer in the area, I guess, due to, like, the locals, you know. They kill anything that they'll see. Now, do they come on your to your land? Do they hunt your land as well as their own? Uh, not that I'm aware of. We have a guy that lives on the land that we hunt with, and he, per- he oversees everything and, and makes sure no one comes around there pretty much. Because that's one thing, and I don't know if you're in, involved with QDMA, but they've got some great programs. They've been setting up co-ops all over, you know, all over uh, the east and the south, and that seems to be working. Where uh, it gets neighbors together, and neighbors being neighbors, and everybody figuring out what's best for the deer. So, so you actually, you know, your deer hunting's getting a lot better. Have you ever looked into that? I I used to read a lot of QDMA magazines. <laughs> but I never looked into it um, for where I hunt. Uh, like I said, the, the locals up there, they're just, they're vicious. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that's something that you might just check out, you know, go to qdme.org and, and check mm-hmm. it out and see who's the local guy because they've done some really good work throughout, uh, you know, throughout the Midwest, throughout the deer mm-hmm. states and, and, they setting up these co-ops and and it's helping you know right. sometimes nothing's going to help and i understand that because mm-hmm. you know hunting to you and me is different than hunting to you know to the other guy right. and it's all still hunting and so that's the good part but uh sometimes if you just sit down and have a cup of coffee and talk about it mm-hmm. it's amazing what can happen right <laughs> let's talk about not over hunting uh your area what do you think about that well i i personally i I like watching the wind i like watch i don't want to over hunt my area much um a few of a few of the other friends that i have that i hunt with they're not like me they'll just hunt a single spot and hunt it and hunt it i'm not seeing that and i'm not seeing that well back off the spot for a little while and you know give it a break you know, and they'll do that, and then they'll start seeing deer again. Um, I like to move around a little bit. You know, um, I have lock-on stands, and I have a climber. I'll move my climber four, five, six times throughout the season, just different areas. Um, so I'm not over hunting one particular area. So to you, is over hunting it sitting it? Uh, three mornings in a row or three afternoons or three days in a row? What, what's your standard for overhunting an area? Uh, three days in a row probably isn't bad. You know, 
four, five, six days, it, you know, you, you're getting too much. You, it's going to overhunt the spot. The deer are going to become aware of what's going on. You know, you coming in and out the, the area is going to alert them. So me personally, I don't like really hunting a spot much more than about two, two, three times in a row. So that would be two mornings in a row or? Yeah, or? like two mornings, you know, an afternoon, something like that. You think that's a, a good strategy because? Uh, I, I'm not, I guess for me, it's worked. Um, just where I'm not. Say that. I'm not giving my giving myself away um, with my scent and me coming in and out my my location, and it's worked well for me anyway. Because I've been told by some pretty good hunters that you know after a couple of times uh, in the same stand, and if you come in the same way, that the deer that are less than you know, a couple hundred yards from that stand, they pattern you and, you know, the hunt's over. Because, right, right. you know, they're just not going to do it. And other people would say, no, I've killed the buck out of this stand for the last 20 years, and, you know, it doesn't matter. So, right. you know, sometimes the people that, especially gun hunting, I, I know we've got some stands on the farms we hunt that they're perennial. You know, if you, if you can hang in there three days, you will sh- you will see a buck. Now I'm not mm-hmm. going to say what how big it is, but you right. will see a buck and have an opportunity to, to take one if if you so choose. Right. Then there's other stands that you can't hunt all the time, but if you hunt it at the right time, you know time and place or everything comes together, you kill the one of the bigger bucks on the farm. So I'm trying to sort out you know how that all works you know, myself, because we're all trying to be better hunters, you know, every single year. Well, every location is different. Uh, my place I hunt in South Louisiana, I have one stand location. That's It's on our family property, but I have one stand that I hunt. And this past season was probably the best season I've ever had in that, in that location. Um, I hunt the way I hunt, I hunt Mississippi and Louisiana every other weekend. Like I go to Mississippi every other weekend and then every other weekend I'm hunting Louisiana. And so I go to the same spot every time on my Louisiana stand, the same stand, same way to walk in every single time. And I've had a great year this year. My Mississippi hunting lease this year just was not a good year at all for us up there. And I've hung a few spots up there two or three times, moved around two or three times. Every location is, is going to be different when it comes to hunting strategy. Why do you think that is? Is it is it cover? Is it temperature? Is it wind? <laughs> I, I guess it's a little of, of all of it. Um, the weather at that time of day, the wind, the just it's a little of everything. I guess. <laughs> I guess we could, if we figure that out, we'd have a best-selling uh, video <laughs> or, or book. Huh? <laughs> right, right, right. Paul, we we'd be famous, right? We'd be famous. Right. <laughs> I wish I could figure that one out because, it, like, like I said, the, my Louisiana land this year was was probably one of the best seasons I've ever had down there, and for whatever reason, I don't know. It, now let's talk about that stand. Yeah, the stand down in Louisiana is is that a box stand? Is that a is a hang on or it's a, you know a, tree stand? A, it's a tree ladder stand. Uh huh. Just an open ladder stand, and it's it's been in that particular spot for ten plus years. 
Yeah. I've, I've killed plenty, plenty, plenty deer out of that thing, that exact location. Okay, let's dissect that. So you got a, you got a, you got a stand down in Louisiana where you've said yourself there's not a lot of deer, but there's deer, just not mm-hmm. a lot of deer. But over 20 years, you've taken a number of deer off that stand. No. Right. So how far do you have to walk from your truck or your or your ATV? And you know, um, is it situated on a ridge or in a funnel? Let's talk yes. about that. My mom, my parents live at the end of the street that I grew up on, and the property is right at the back of of her house. So I just park at her house, and it's about a half a mile walk to the sand through the woods. Um, on one side, it's all the side I hunt. It's all woods, trees, uh, cypress trees, oak trees. On one side is private property, about 300 acres of private property. That's also got a big giant thicket on the property which is where the deer stay at. And like I said, the deer don't stay on our property because it's just a small tract of land, but they stay on that 300 acres and they cut, they come across our property. And where I'm located, I'm about a hundred yards from where the buyer's at. So the deer have to walk between me and the buyer. So it's been really good for me in that location. Now, is this a rifle stand or is it an archery stand? I, I rifle and bow hunt out of it. So are you getting deer to walk by within 30 or 40 yards or closer? Uh, just two weeks ago, I had two yearlings walk five yards from me. That's exciting, isn't it? Oh, it, it, it is. I love it. <laughs> when, I, when they come up from behind me, so when I turn my head and I seen them and there was three of them one walked about 10 yards but the other two walked at five yards from my tree and they just come walking by like like I wasn't even there now downward that in Louisiana what are the what are the deer feeding on other you know is there agricultural areas or are they just feeding feeding on you know forbs and and mast and and whatever's in the forest just natural forage the there there's acorn trees um briars they eat a lot of briars so we do have a lot of briars around there there's really no agriculture around that area No, have you ever thought of put, putting the micro plot in? I did that a few years back, um, and it it did well for me. And I just hadn't. It's been such a busy couple last couple of years that I hadn't had a chance. Um, here in Louisiana, we can feed, and what I usually do if I know I'm going to hunt the area, I'll go put some feed on the ground, and. It's worked very well. So can you have feeders that, you know, that will will turn on and tur- turn off or use mm-hmm. a gravity feeder or how, how do you feed them? In Louisiana, we can have a feeder, gravity feeder, a uh, broadcast feeder, or we can put it on the ground in Louisiana. And usually so I'll just, just put it on the go ground. Ahead. I'll so just you put just it carry- on the ground because it's easier. Now, are you taking soybeans in there? Are you taking alfalfa pellets or corn, or what are you putting on the ground? We use a lot of rice bran. Now, what is that? For Explain it to the northern boy like me. What, what is that? <laughs> I, I'm not 100% sure what it is. I'm not. <laughs> the deer, There's they a lot of man. <laughs> but they absolutely love it. Um, we, we'll use corn, but we have such a big issue with with coons around here. Yeah, that the coons will just de- demolish the corn, and they don't fool with the rice bran nearly as much. What about hogs? What about feral hogs? Where I'm at now, we don't have any. They're around here, but with the spot I'm hunting, we don't have any yet. Well, you're fortunate for that because they can really mess things up. Right. 
Let's talk about one thing that you share with me in the warm up, Paul, about being a patient hunter. What does that mean to you, and how's that helped you become a better hunter? Well, uh, at any given moment, anything can happen in, in the woods. Any hunter knows you can sit for hours and not see a single deer, and in a split second, it just comes alive, and they come in from everywhere. And for me, there's times I've, I've told myself, look, just, just give up this year. And I, I didn't. And I ended up, you know, killing me a deer. So just being patient and sticking out, sticking, sticking with it, 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 things can change real fast. So how do you keep yourself from, you know, getting down? You go, I know they're here and, you know, this is the 10th day in a row I've hunted or the 10th weekend and I'm not seeing anything. What do you do to, you know, to keep, you know, keep yourself going? I love it too much. (laughs) I love being in that tree and just the peace and quiet. And I know, I know that they're there. There's signs, and at any moment, it's, it's going to happen. Something's going to happen, and I'm going to see, you know, I'm going to see one. Well, Paul, we're at the time of the show. It's hard to believe almost 30 minutes have gone by, but that's where we're at. So take a minute or two, and thank you for your sponsors. Again, give a shout-out to Country Camel Outdoors there, Gina and Larry, and uh, anybody else you want to give a shout-out to. I, I want to thank Jenna. Mostly she found me on um, Camel Photo and asked me if I'd be interested in joining their team. And I, I, I told her, yeah. And it's it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. And I really appreciate the opportunity that they've given me. Um, and we can find if. Anyone that has any questions on anything, you know, hunting the South, fishing the South, you know, they can find me on countrycameloutdoors.com. Any other sponsors? Um, I'd, I'd like to thank all the sponsors for Country Camo Outdoors. Um, they've been very helpful in getting us to where we are. Um, and we're planning on getting bigger and definitely getting better. Uh, I think this is going to be a big, big year for Country Camel Outdoor. Well, Paul, thank you so much for you being a guest on Whitetail Rendezvous. And I know uh, myself, I, I've got a couple of notes here that um, – you know, I'm going to be thinking about, and I hope our listeners took some notes. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm fortunate to have Paul Raleigh from Pro Staff of Country Cam Outdoors on the show today. And Paul, thanks so much for being a guest. Thank you very much, Bruce. As your host at Whitetail Ronabu, I want to thank each and every one of you for spending your time with us today. I look forward to sharing with you in the next episode more whitetail hunting tips, techniques, and stories. Until then, keep the sun at your back, the wind in your face, and always be patient. If you have any tips, comments, or suggestions, or what we can do to improve, because we're here to serve you, let us know. Thanks for listening to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast at www.whitetailrendezvous.com.